This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. When Chad Langford, a 20-year-old Army MP, was found mortally wounded, a cap was stuffed in his mouth, a cord wrapped around his neck, and his ankles were bound. The Army believes Langford did these things to himself as a prelude to suicide. His family is convinced he was murdered. When news sessions of Thermopolis, Wyoming, agreed to store an old footlocker for a friend, he got more than he bargained for, an unidentified human skeleton and a perplexing, unsolved mystery. In 1978, a police chief in Oklahoma was mortally wounded during a shootout with two armed robbers. Seven years later, his killer, David Gordon Smith, escaped from prison and vanished. For nearly eight years, David Smith lived on the run, successfully eluding capture, until he was recognized by one of our viewers. Join me for this dramatic update and more on tonight's Unsolved Mysteries. March 12, 1992, 7.40 p.m. Along the deserted perimeter of Redstone Arsenal Army Base in Huntsville, Alabama, 20-year-old military policeman Chad Langford was completing what should have been a routine patrol. Redstone, this is Papa 30 minutes later, Langford radioed his base station, informing them he was stopping to investigate an abandoned car. I'm on Patton South. Roger, Senior 28. Papa 2-1, say again. 2-1, this is Redstone, say again. Get a unit. All available units proceed to South Patton Road, locate Papa 2-1. All gates locked down, secure the post. Approximately 10 miles from MP headquarters, a backup officer found unsettling evidence that Langford was in jeopardy. Close to the entrance of a civilian recreation area that is part of the base, he found Langford's military ID tag, his armband, and his portable police radio. They had been deliberately arranged in the middle of the street. A quarter of a mile away, the patrolling officer made the discovery he had been dreading. Redstone, this is Papa Sierra. I've located Papa 2-1 at bunker 8745. Officer is down. I request ambulance and backup immediately. The officer was stunned by Langford's condition. The MP was bleeding from a head wound and breathing faintly. His cap had been stuffed into his mouth, and the cord from his radar unit had been wrapped around his neck. His pistol strap was tied around his ankles. Langford's handcuffs were clamped on his left wrist, and on his left hand was a cryptic message written in black ink, March 3, and what looked like the name Robert. He's still alive. Let me get his shirt off. Careful, careful. careful. Let's roll him over. Check the wounds. Okay? Oddly, Langford's 45 caliber pistol was found under his left shoulder. Get that out of here. Later examination would show two rounds had been fired, although it could not be determined whether one of them had hit Langford. Get an ambulance here ASAP. Go. Just hang in there, Langford. Come on, buddy. Chad Langford was rushed to Huntsville Hospital, where he died two hours later. Langford was four months shy of his 21st birthday. Chad Langford's family had assumed he was killed in the line of duty. They were shocked to learn that the Army apparently believed Chad had taken his own life.
Uh, when, I, when I heard that, I was very upset about the whole thing. I, I know that my boy did not kill, kill himself. There's no way. I feel that he, uh, someone is covering something up here. Chad Lankford was raised by his father and grandmother in the small Northern California community of Elk Creek. Chad joined the Army right out of high school and soon found himself with U.S. forces stationed in South Korea. There he earned several good conduct medals. At the conclusion of that tour of duty, he joined the military police at Redstone Arsenal in Alabama. According to his family, Chad loved Army life and planned to re-enlist. However, early in 1992, Chad's attitude suddenly changed. In January, he called me and told me that uh, he'd been asked to uh, do some you know, undercover work. He called me three or four different times, and uh, each time he'd give me a little bit about his still working undercover and, and uh, sounded quite frustrated if you get set sometimes. Hi, Dad. How you doing? Yeah, OK, I guess. Listen, remember what I told you a few weeks ago about my new assignment? Well, it's getting pretty intense. I had asked him and just exactly what he was working on, and he said, with guns and drugs. Um, and numerous times he told me, uh, probably two or three times, he told me that uh, uh, if he was found out that uh, he was a dead man. I've been getting threats, you know, phone calls and letters. No, I don't know who's sending them. I, I don't recognize his voice. I mean, it, it, it might be nothing, but I'm starting to get worried. I don't know what to do. That time I told him. I can't, I can't. You know, told him, Chad, you got to get out of this. And uh, he came back with, I can't get out of it. I can't get out of it, Dad. And I said, well, you got to get out of it if it's Listen, go that bad. You right now. OK. I will. Give my love to Grandma. Bye. When Jim Langford urged his son to talk to his undercover superior, Chad said he would not be able to for another 14 days. But in 14 days, Chad Langford was found bleeding from a fatal bullet wound to the head. The Army's Criminal Investigation Division, or CID, reviewed Chad Langford's death for four months. Their report stated that Langford had not been involved in any undercover narcotics work. The CID finding echoed the Army's preliminary judgment. Chad Langford had taken his own life. The report included what the CID called a psychological autopsy, a post-mortem evaluation of mental health. It described Langford as having serious, lifelong emotional problems. The report that they sent me, the psychological autopsy they sent me, no, that's so far out of whack, it's unbelievable. I'm sorry, I just can't believe that, any of that. I mean, I, mean, I raised the boy for 20 years. I know him better than that. And uh, the military has psychologist out to talk to you for or call you over the phone and talk to you for 10 minutes and then they have the complete life story of everybody and uh, they're so far off base it's unbelievable the report claimed that a deterioration in chad's relationship with his girlfriend had triggered his final suicidal depression the cid report said that chad committed suicide for the distraught over my breaking up with him but that wasn't true um, I didn't break up with Chad. Chad broke up with me. I don't know what I should major in. In January of 1992, six weeks before his death, Chad had abruptly broken up with Roxanne. I don't know. I mean, I've got to make up my mind soon, because after we get married... Roxanne, we need to talk. What? Listen. We're going to have to put off getting married. I don't, I don't understand. I mean, wh why? It's my work. This new assignment has taken a lot of my time, and it just wouldn't be fair to you. I mean, you deserve to have a lot of my attention. You still love me, don't you? I'm involved in things you don't even understand. I can't even talk about them. But why? I mean, I mean, why do we have to break up? Is there another person? Is that it? That's it, isn't it? Why no, there's no one why? else. Why do we have to break up? Can't you understand English? Just get out! I left. I don't want to be with you anymore. In a rage, crying. I had a feeling that 
someone was telling him to break it off with me. And I think Chad did it to protect me or something. Roxanne saw Chad for the last time, five days before his death at the base nightclub. He seemed to have changed dramatically. Chad was dressed all in black, gang-style clothing. He now sported an earring and was hanging out with several rough-looking men Roxanne had not seen before. Langford's lifestyle changes tie in with another shocking CID allegation that he had been the mastermind of an aborted robbery plan targeting base PX funds. The CID report included interviews with three soldiers who identified Chad as the ringleader. One of you guys will have to shoot me. Shoot you? Yeah, yeah. But I'll be wearing a bulletproof vest. That way it'll look like I put up a fight. I'll probably have to fire off a couple of rounds so I don't look like a punk. All right. Now what about the other escort? Won't he be able to identify us? Well, I guess we'll just have to kill him. Unless we want witnesses. It seems very strange to me that somebody would come forward to the criminal investigation division after someone was killed and said, yeah, we're planning on robbing, we were planning on robbing a PX fan for X amount of thousand dollars. I, I just can't imagine anybody coming forward with that kind of information. Uh, it's really tough that he, you know, he's not here now to be able to uh, tell us what really happened. Now the plan is, you'll be one of the escorts. You'll wear a bulletproof vest. Chaz's father believes there is a legitimate explanation for any contact his son may have had with criminal elements on the base. Maybe they were trying to recruit him. Maybe this was right in, the, in his, uh, what he was doing uh, with the informant or the undercover work. Hours before his death, Chad left phone messages for several friends, but not for his family. The CID interpreted Chad's calls as goodbye messages to those he cared for most. When I got off work, my mother told me that there was a message on the machine from Chad that had been erased, but she heard it. Hi, it's me. It was him calling to say hi and how was I doing, was I taking care of myself, and that he would see me soon. Sorry I missed you. Give me a call. Bye. It didn't seem like a goodbye to me. Chad uh, would have called uh, me. I know he would have. He would have called me if, uh, if something was to the point where, you know, he was going to commit suicide. I know he would have. Uh, but he didn't call me, and he didn't call his grandmother. Uh, so there weren't, go weren't goodbye calls, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, uh, I know he would have called me. The psychological autopsy claimed that Chad Langford had a profound lack of self-esteem and was desperate to create a new image, even at the cost of his own life. According to the report, Chad felt that the glory eluding him in life would finally be his if he appeared to have died in a heroic last stand. Psychological autopsy more or less uh, told us that he was doing this to make us feel good about him because we wanted him to shine and, and uh, he was doing this to, to please us and that he wanted to go out in glory. So this is why he set this whole thing up. This is why he drove out there and handcuffed himself. He didn't want us to go out in a, and go around the car and do away with yourself. You know, he just he wanted to make it, uh, make it special. The official inquiry concluded that every aspect of Chad's death was methodically staged by Chad himself, from his accounts of undercover assignments to the peculiar circumstances of his shooting. Redstone, this is Papa 2-1. have a stranded vehicle. I'm on Patton South. One. What's your location? I'm on Patton South. Roger, send you 28. 2 1, say again. 2 1, this is Redstone, say again. All available units, proceed to South Patton Road and locate Papa 2 1. All gates locked down. Secure the post.
to start with, it was very bizarre even from the night that it happened because um, the Huntsville Police Department and the other law enforcement agencies never heard a word from the Army about any of it. And generally when there's a, a police officer that's shot, I mean, there'll be a manhunt, you know, everywhere. And everybody was really baffled because they weren't getting any information about it. Uh, you take into consideration that he was tied with his own equipment, uh, that it happened in a very remote area that with easy access to the civilian recreation area. Um, anybody could have gotten in and out there very, very easily. And then even before the Army ruled that it was suicide, there was just wild speculation as to what could have happened to him. People were saying espionage, drug deals, all kinds of things. Then it perpetuated itself as it went with the CID reports. According to Langford's family, even some of the evidence gathered from the death scene conflicts with the suicide finding. Investigators recovered two 45 caliber casings, but they found no bullets of any kind in or near the body. Without bullets, authorities were unable to determine what type of gun killed Langford. In addition, lab tests did not conclusively prove Langford had even fired a weapon, and there was never an explanation of how he came to be lying on top of his own gun. Uh, they also said there wasn't a struggle, but there was a struggle. I mean, I mean, there's no doubt about it. They found two buttons in the front, front seat of the car. And those two buttons uh, were supposedly pulled off his uniform when the medics got there. This was their explanation to me that when they ripped open his shirt, both buttons flew in the front seat of the car. And uh, that's completely impossible, because I've reset that up and there's no way. Uh, from where he was laying, and uh, the side his buttons were on, his buttons would have went the other way. They wouldn't have went into the car. Jim Langford also believes that MPs responding to his son's distress call squandered opportunities to question possible suspects. Within a mile of where Chad was found, MPs stopped two different cars. However, contrary to military regulations, no record was made of the driver's names or of either car's make, model, or license number. The drivers were never questioned about Langford's death. Uh, just letting him go, I mean, uh, it's, it's absolutely crazy. Uh, you're talking about a, uh, a murder here. And it appears to me that anybody within a uh, three or four mile radius of that place should have been stopped and held for some, for some time. But they didn't do that. They let the man go. A source close to the investigation has said that one of the drivers was named Robert. The name found scrawled on Langford's hand. Those who believe Chad Langford was working undercover are convinced his sudden violent death was nothing less than murder. I feel that he went down there on that part of base because he was supposed to meet somebody down there. And when I talked to him on the first part of March, he told me that he couldn't talk to his contact for at least two more weeks. And that was just about the same time he was supposed to talk to his contact. And he drove down at the end of that road down there, and there was a vehicle there, but he knew who was in that vehicle. And he phoned in just to get away from his radio. Stone, this is Papa 2-1. I'm checking out a stranded vehicle. I'm on Patton South. Roger, Senior 28. It would have taken more than one person to, to, uh, to handle Chad. He uh, was very strong, very agile. Uh, and then again, he knew these people. I know he knew these people. Redstone, this is Papa 2-1. I need backup now. This is Papa 2 I think Chad was involved in, uh, involved what he was telling he was involved in. He was an in-between person with some drug dealing. Um, I think he was put in that position by somebody on that base, whether military or civilian, he put, somebody put him there. And I think he was a middleman and I think he was set up. I really feel he was set up. And uh, I'm gonna find out. Chad Langford's final hours remain shrouded in mystery. Did he invent a tale of undercover intrigue and then stage a heroic death? 
Or did Chad Lankford truly die a hero, gunned down in the line of duty? Next, thanks to our viewers, a convicted killer has been captured nearly eight years after he escaped from prison. Just after 8 a.m. on September 1st, 1978, in Catoosa, Oklahoma, Police Chief J.B. Hamby responded to an emergency call from an auto license tag agency. Twenty rounds ricocheted through the small store in a matter of seconds. One robber was killed, the other was hit twice, but somehow managed to escape. Less than five minutes later, Chief Hamby died from gunshot wounds. He was a 24-year veteran of law enforcement and the only police officer in Catoosa. On June 15, 1979, the surviving gunman, 25-year-old David Gordon Smith, began serving a life sentence for the murder of J.B. Hamby. Open 43! Smith became a model prisoner and eventually achieved trustee status. Seven years after he murdered Chief Hamby, David Gordon Smith took advantage of his status to escape and to disappear. When we first aired this story last October, we received more than 75 leads, but none of them panned out. However, one thing we have learned on Unsolved Mysteries over the years is never to give up. The story aired again in March, and this time in a small South Dakota town, the right viewer was watching. He called the local authorities, and they immediately contacted the FBI. One day following the airing of the David Gordon Smith case on Unsolved Mysteries, an anonymous tip was received giving us his location. He was working as a service manager at an automobile dealership in Spearfish, South Dakota. Agents of the FBI, local authorities in South Dakota went to his place of employment. He was arrested without incident and he readily admitted his identity upon questioning. When David Gordon Smith is brought back to Oklahoma, he'll go immediately into our, our system. He'll be classified as a maximum security inmate. And uh, because of his uh, escape, uh, he will be in our maximum security prison for a long time. There's a tremendous amount of relief. Uh, it was equivalent to a, a long-term gigantic debt being paid off. On December 14, 1983, a masked gunman held up a fast food restaurant in Toledo, Ohio. As he rushed to escape, he shot a police officer at close range, seriously wounding him. The next day, Morgan Anthony Miller, a 27-year-old musician, was arrested after being identified by two eyewitnesses. Miller never denied that he and two friends had been in the restaurant that night. However, he always insisted that the robbers struck sometime after they left. Everything that they said that I had done was totally ridiculous. There's no way a real criminal would drive his own car up to a restaurant, talk to a waitress who works there, and 30 seconds later rob the place and not expect to get caught. I'm not crazy. A month later, the case took a surprising twist when police arrested 35-year-old Joseph Clark in an unrelated case. During questioning, Clark admitted that he had robbed the restaurant and shot the police officer. I was the one that shot that police. But when detectives pressed him for details, Clark recanted. 
Five months later, Tony Miller was convicted of armed robbery and assault. He was given a sentence of 20 to 40 years in prison. I absolutely did not commit the robbery or the shooting of the police officer. And I would never do anything like that. I'm a musician and artist. I'm not a criminal. Update. Tony Miller is now a free man. On the night of our broadcast, one of the prosecution witnesses from Tony's trial called our telecenter and corroborated Tony's story. The man had seen the robber flee the area, but had never been asked to identify Miller. After viewing our story, the witness said, quote, it was the first time I had seen photographs of Tony Miller and the other man. Based on those photographs and my recollection that evening, the man who ran past me was not Tony Miller. On December 2nd, 1992, Tony Miller's conviction was reversed. A week later, he was released from prison after eight and a half long years. For a while, you think that, you know, this is just like a, a dream. It's just, uh, it's hard to describe. It feels so good. I just wanted to scream, but I'm scared if I did, it'd lock me back up. So I, <laughs> I didn't scream, but uh, I was really happy. Tony is one of the most enjoyable people I've ever met, and having him out of prison has just increased his natural joy and happiness. He's a very special person. How do you feel? Good. When you know you're innocent, you know, there's no doubt about it in your mind that you haven't done a crime, and you know it, you can't give up, especially when you have support of your family, you know, a lot of my family members, Granny, I love her dearly, uh, to know that they're fighting as hard as they possibly can, to simply get to the truth. Because the truth will surface, regardless of how long it takes, it comes to the top every time. In a city as large as Philadelphia, police operators receive literally thousands of reports every day regarding possible criminal activity. Most of the calls are routine, but some are so unbelievable that even the most world-weary detectives can be taken by surprise. On September 10, 1991, Detective Pat Brennan was stunned to receive not one, but three telephone calls from a convicted rapist named Julius Patterson. Those calls would launch one of the most bizarre and disturbing murder investigations the city has ever known. We'll find a body. Whose body? Out of the blue, Patterson confessed to a shocked Brennan that he and his girlfriend, Paulette Height, had killed two people one in 1986 and the other in 1988. P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N. And when did Paulette Height kill your sister? Incredibly, Patterson admitted that one of the victims was his own sister. He even revealed where her body could be found. I need a little bit more information from you. I'm going to need a date of birth, a social security number, where you're living. He was like a man on a mission. He was out to convince me and anyone else that would listen to him that what he had to say was real and he was out to make the police act on it. With this urgency in his voice and, and the detail to what he was saying to us just made me feel that everything he, he was saying was the truth and would be founded. Detectives were immediately dispatched to the address Patterson had yeah. given. Yeah? Hi, ma'am. I'm sorry to bother you. We're from the police department. The current resident had lived there for several months and had a difficult time believing there might be a body in the basement. How do you know he was telling the truth? Well, we have to check it out, ma'am. It's probably just a crime call, hopefully. We don't want to be here all night. Are you sure this is the right house? Yes, it is. Patterson had told detectives to look for a discolored patch of cement. What are you going to do if you find anything? We probably won't, but we have to check it out. There's the carpet. Okay. At the foot of the steps, under an old tattered carpet, they found an area which fit the description. But it remained to be seen what, if anything, might be buried beneath the floor. At almost that same moment, Detective Brennan received another call from Julius Patterson. 
Earlier, he had said that his girlfriend, Paulette Height, could be found at a motel in New Jersey. Now he was demanding to know if she had been arrested. Once I confirmed for him that detectives were at the crime scene and that there were detectives en route to South Jersey, he stated he would call back. He hung up the phone and he never called back. Using sledgehammers and shovels, the anxious investigators began to excavate. Soon their worst fears were confirmed. Yeah, thank you, get a body. Julius Patterson had been telling the truth. Let me get a shot. Yeah, we gotta get shot. How about a scale? Julius Patterson has to be the worst type of person possible. Uh, for somebody to, to want to kill your sister, it's just mind boggling. Like I said, I've never seen that in my entire police career. Something that tragic, especially. Police soon learned that from 1984 to 1986, Julius Patterson and Paulette Height and Julius' sister, Jessie, had lived together in the house. Other members of the Patterson family confirmed that Jessie had mysteriously vanished in July of 1986. Testing later confirmed that the bones were the remains of Julius Patterson's 26-year-old sister, Jessie. She had been born blind, deaf, and mute. It is almost too horrible to imagine that her brother, who'd been entrusted with her care, had murdered her, apparently as part of a devious scheme to cash in on her social security benefits. But the investigation was just heating up. Julius Patterson had confessed to a second murder and had identified the victim as Gordy. Police eventually learned that during the 1980s, a man named Hall Luther Gordon, who suffered from Alzheimer's disease, had also been under the care of Julius Patterson and Paulette Height. Though unlicensed, Height made her living by providing home care for the elderly. She had met Gordon at a local boarding house. He was last seen in July of 1986. Around the same time, his two caretakers moved away from the neighborhood. If you look at both of the individuals, uh, Hall Luther Gordon and Jesse Patterson, uh, both of these people, um, for totally different reasons, were incapable of taking care of themselves and were completely at the mercy of the people that were entrusted with their care. Um, because someone took advantage of that situation, and that in itself is not that unusual, unfortunately, but the fact that they actually went on to kill them uh, for no other reason than to to increase their own wealth. Um, yes, that did take a special significance for us. These pictures of Julius Patterson and Paulette Height were taken by a bank ATM camera in August and September of 1991. Authorities believe that over a 10-year period, the pair may have stolen as much as $150,000 from their victims. FBI agent Richard Kane and Detective Duzak traced the missing fugitives to a motel in South New Jersey. Got a photograph. Does this mean anything? They arrived only to discover that Patterson and Height had moved out the week before. He was here almost a year. Uh... We were able to track Paulette to another hotel down the road and found that she had stayed there for a night or two under an assumed name and had left there hurriedly, abandoning possessions. Julius Patterson and Paulette Height were last seen in Philadelphia in September of 1991. The couple robbed an old friend of the Patterson family at gunpoint and then promptly dropped from sight. Julius Patterson is 38 years old. He is 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighs 150 pounds. He is wanted for questioning regarding the death of his sister, Jessie, and the disappearance of Hall Luther Gordon. He is also wanted for armed robbery, assault, and parole violations. Paulette Height is 44 years old. She is 5 feet 3 inches tall and weighs 190 pounds. She uses the alias's Collette Hoop, or Pauletta Price. She is wanted on charges of armed robbery and fraudulent receipt of Social Security payments. She is also wanted for questioning regarding Jesse Patterson and Hall Luther Gordon. 
Following our most recent broadcast of this story, a former employer, Paulette Height, called our phone center to report that Height had been working in a fast food restaurant in Cliffside Park, New Jersey, under an assumed name. Here's what happened next, according to Philadelphia Police Lieutenant Joseph Whitty. Uh, it gave us a social security number she used, and the FBI tracked that social security number to a welfare recipient in New York City. Uh, FBI agents in the New York City Police Department staked out the location where she was to pick up her checks. At that time, both Julius Patterson and Paulette Height were apprehended. After the arrest, Julius Patterson led police to this empty warehouse in North Philadelphia, where he said he had left the partial remains of Hall Luther Gordon. Police records confirmed that some human bones had been found there in 1989. The police now believe that they were the remains of Hall Luther Gordon. Three weeks later, Patterson led police back to the same area, claiming that he had buried yet another victim there. During the search, the unexpected happened. While behind the factory, he saw one of the detectives knocking him down and then ran down the railroad, adjacent railroad tracks and jumped off a railroad trussle that was about 10 feet tall onto a street and then uh, made his escape. Three days later, Julius Patterson was captured in an intersection in North Philadelphia. When he was apprehended, Patterson was standing at a bus stop wearing severed handcuffs concealed under a coat. Sometimes from the most unlikely elements comes a tantalizing mystery and confirmation that the truth is stranger than fiction. The mystery might start, say, with this broken down footlocker. Who can guess what the old trunk might contain or where it might lead? Perhaps to a small town in Wyoming called Thumopolis. In 1986, a longtime resident whom we will call Gabby, moved away from Thermopolis. He left some of his belongings, including the old locked trunk and a shed. He left the shed with a friend, Newell Sessions. Six years crept by. Finally, Newell couldn't stand the suspense another minute. Let's just see what's in here. No telling what we'll find. I doubt if you'll find much of anything. Uh-oh. My goodness, it's a skeleton. It's, it's human. Gee, what do you think about that? Uh, it's been in there a long time. Nobody could believe that we had uncovered a human skeleton. And there wasn't too much said at that time. I think it was my wife asked me what we was going to do with it. And I said, I think that the best thing we could do with it would be to take it out here and dig a hole and give it a proper burial. Newell's wife put her foot down. She told him he had to call the sheriff. Before he did, though, oh, Newell felt fine. obliged to contact I've Gabby. Karen and the kids. Oh, they're just fine. So what's up? Well, uh, you remember that shed you left up here? I sure do. Uh, then you remember the footlocker that was in the shed? Yes, I was going to... Gabby told Newell that he'd never even opened the footlocker. He thought he'd bought it at a garage sale. But when it came to the time and the place, Gabby's memory failed him. Well, when I cut the lock off, I found a human skeleton in the trunk. You're uh, not serious about this, are you, Newell? And he acted uh, probably as surprised as I did when I, when I opened the trunk, that he couldn't believe it. He thought I was kidding him. And I told him, no, I'm not kidding you. There is a human skeleton in there. Newell Sessions contacted John Lumley, the sheriff of Hot Springs County. Right from the start, Sheriff Lumley smelled a rat. Newell doesn't know much. He said, Gabby doesn't know much. I've talked to a lot of people about this case, and everybody's said, almost 99.99% or more, that they would have opened it immediately upon purchasing it. They said if they went to a yard sale or garage sale, 
bought a trunk, that's half the excitement. It's like a Christmas present. Can't wait to get home to open it. I don't think my curiosity is any less than the others, although it apparently has a tendency to atrophy. Um, because I, I know I took the thing home. I didn't have a hacksaw. I was going to cut the lock on. And that's a lot of work. Two days later, another bombshell. X-rays revealed a bullet lodged in the skull. Now Sheriff Lumley thought he might have a murder case on his hands. He decided he'd better have a chat with Gabby. Where did you buy the trunk at, Gabby? Oh, I guess it was uh, 73. Gabby was awfully vague about the details. He said he might have bought the trunk in Wyoming, or in Iowa, Illinois, or maybe Oklahoma. It might have been as early as 1973, but it might not have been. Gabby just couldn't be sure. He's trying to find furniture for the new place. Well, my being a suspect, I, first off, I, I wasn't the least bit worried about. Why? What do I have to worry about? I mean, really, you know, I know I didn't do the guy. You know, I didn't shoot this dude. Um, I'm barely, in fact, I'm not, I'm not even as old as the gun that shot him. Gabby is, is in his mid-40s. The footlocker and the lock were made back in the 30s time period. I don't believe that Gabby was, was the person that caused the death to this person. But my thoughts have always been that he has knowledge of who the person in the trunk is or where they came from. I have to put tools in. For the record, Gabby says he doesn't know one single thing about the bones in the footlocker. And at this point, he's a little irked by the whole mess. On March 31, 1992, Sheriff Lumley turned the skeleton over to the Wyoming State Crime Lab in Cheyenne. Maybe the bones could tell him what Gabby couldn't. Boy, it sure doesn't look like there's any organization to these bones, are they? Not really. OK, well, let's start laying it out. He was in his 50s to uh, mid-60s, probably stood about 5'8", plus or minus an inch and a half, um, was a Caucasian male. The bullet was then turned over to our firearms examiner, who was able to identify it as uh, coming from a 25 caliber uh, weapon that was produced in the uh, early 1900s, 1904, and then available in the United States about 1908. Oh, here's a plastic bag. Also in the trunk was a rotted plastic bag from a supermarket chain called Hyvee's. The bag with that particular logo was not manufactured until the early 1950s. It's like a potato sack. Investigators figured that the skeleton had been buried once, only to be dug up and crammed unceremoniously into the footlocker. In an effort to identify the victim, Sandra Mays fashioned a three-dimensional reconstruction in clay. The result is uncanny. Only the eyes and hair are guesswork. Otherwise, this should be a good likeness of the man who somehow got a bullet in his head sometime after 1908. Strangely, both of his lower leg bones and one hand were missing. On his rib cage, there were several nicks, which might have been made by bullets. mystery, there is someone, somewhere, who knows the truth. Join me next week for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Mm -hmm.